and you're very welcome to episode 15 of The Fifth Court, a podcast on legal affairs presented by myself, Peter Leonard Barrister. And myself, Mark Tottenham, Barrister and editor of Decisis.ie. And Mark, the big news is that we have a sponsor on board at the moment, which we're very grateful for. This is Practice Evolve Software, who combine document management and accounting software, offering law firms a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. Indeed. So we're very grateful to our sponsor for coming on board. Uh, how are you, Mark? You all right? Very well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, uh, good, good d- new year. Delighted to see we're number five in the uh, uh, Irish business uh, podcast you did your charts. Homework. I did That's indeed. very good. I think very we're the good. second actual Irish podcast in that in that, that chart. So. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're, we're definitely wearing the green mm. jersey. That's that, that's really good. Well, last week, you will recall, we had a fascinating interview, a really fascinating interview with Barrister Gemma McLaughlin-Burke, who told us about her time working as a judicial assistant with Mr. Justice Robert Houghton in the Court of Appeal. Uh, this was one I think you really enjoyed, Mark. I, I found it very interesting, and I think I think it's had a lot of traction, particularly among colleges. I think yeah, it's the such universities have gone for, mad yeah, for it, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. Which is really good, and I yeah. know we've been retweeted. I think that's the phrase by uh, UCD Sutherland Law School, which we are delighted with. And uh, we would ask any other law schools out there uh, if they want to share our podcast. And if anybody we'd be has, very a, grateful. has a child or a favourite nephew who, who who's looking at a career in the law, they should definitely listen to it. But she was brilliant, and she was really good, and it's it's just it's it's wonderfully described, and and what a wonderful opportunity she got, and boy did she take it. Well, on today's show, our guest is Senior Counsel Ted Harding, who has a very interesting backstory. Before entering the law library, he was the editor of the Sunday Business Post. As a practising barrister, Ted was involved as defence counsel in a number of criminal cases which emerged in relation to the collapse of Anglo-Irish Bank, and we're going to talk to him about those. Uh, And we're also going to talk to him about moving from the world of cutting-edge journalism into courtroom advocacy. So I'm really looking forward to that. But first, we're going to discuss three cases which you have identified from the Decisis website. First of all, we're going to start with the ongoing fallout from the COVID pandemic. This is a very curious contract case. It is the case of the health service executive versus Roftec. Uh, and this is a high court decision of Mr. Justice Heslin. Now, there's a very serious backdrop to this case. Uh, this was the HSC at the start of the pandemic, yep. uh, anticipating an increase in mortalities, I suppose, as a result yep. of the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and they made preparation for the pressure that would be placed on the country's mortuaries uh, by purchasing inflatable mortuaries from a company in the UK. However, there was a difficulty when they tried to put these into practice. Mark, will you tell us more? Yeah. So, uh, obviously, at the beginning of the COVID um, pandemic, the, the images from countries like like Italy and Spain suggested that there were going to be kind of, you know, that there simply wouldn't be room to put the um, the, the people dying of COVID. And so to, to make preparations, the, the HSE then entered into a contract with this company, Roftec, to buy what they called flex mort- mortuaries. And these are basically inflatable mortuaries. They, and uh, the, it sounds like a tent effectively, but it, it's obviously much more high tech than that in that these are temperature controlled and uh, all that kind of thing. The problem was that when they inflated these, um, they started to burst at the seams. Okay. Um, well, and at least one of them... That's once not they, good, as they say. Exactly. And at least one of them, once w- once they repaired it, found that there were other weak spots, other holes developed. So they, they, they clearly weren't get... They weren't that they weren't fit for purpose, essentially. So that's when um, the lawyers got involved. Indeed. Um, and so the HSC obviously issued proceedings against the, uh, the, the suppliers under sale of goods legislation. But the suppliers tried to suggest that it should have been that the action should have been brought in the UK rather than Ireland. Okay, Mark. So, so essentially, the issue here was in which jurisdiction should the proceedings take place? Exactly. And obviously, the HSE wanted them to take place in Ireland. They issued the proceedings in Ireland, um, but the defendant tried to suggest that they should have been brought in the UK. And the issue here is the Brussels Convention, which concerns the enforcement of judgments in in various different ju- jurisdictions. And an issue certainly arose in relation. to to the um, to the UK leaving the EU and to what extent the EU conventions applied to proceedings between Ireland and the UK. So anybody who's involved in in um, litigating against I- English-based companies should certainly be aware of this decision. Okay. But ultimately, what um, Mr. Justice Heslin uh, decided was that that, that 
by nature of the, because of the nature of the proceedings, this was a, an action that could be brought in Ireland and should be brought in Ireland, and that the Irish courts did have jurisdiction. Okay, now that the jurisdiction was also the issue in the next case we have yeah. for you, and this is another fascinating contract dispute, uh, where, as I said, the issue of jurisdiction was all important. This is the case of Glanbia Foods Ireland versus EDNF Man Liquid Products Ireland Limited, and this is a decision of Mr. Justice Sanfi. Now this concerned a nine million damages claim brought by Glanbia against a company which had supplied it with molasses. You might have to explain a little bit more, Mark, about molasses, uh, which was to be integrated into its feed products, yeah. I think, so going forward. And I know you love these farm cases because it brings you back to that idyllic youth of yours in, in that farm in that, County Wicklow. But uh, molasses, will you tell us what molasses yeah. so, is? So, well, this is, uh, well, molasses is, is uh, a, a kind of a sugar beet. Sh- 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 sugar based uh, supplement, which in this particular product is being used in the equine industry. Yes. Um, and this uh, supplier appears to have supplied it to uh, outside of Ireland as well, because the, the, the issue was picked up in France, where certain racehorses were found to have consumed a banned substance. Um, which is and, obviously huge. Which is know, a huge yes. issue. So they couldn't run. And quite a number of horses in France were found not to have consumed this, and it was traced back to this um, supplier of molasses. Now, Glanby obviously is a huge retailer in Ireland and probably has contracts with a lot, with a lot of stables or stud farms, and so they have and now they they were claiming damages of nine million, and there was also reference to third party actions against Glanby arising from this particular product because obviously no no stable wants to find that they that all of their horses have been consuming a banned product, so. Again, this company, like in the last case we were talking about, tries to suggest that the Irish courts didn't have jurisdiction. Curious thing here was that the defendant was an Irish-based company, but tried to suggest that they had incorporated um, what they called the Grain and Free Trade Association contract as part of their terms of sale. Okay, and this would have given jurisdiction to the UK courts. Ah, so that was a, a UK-based yeah. agreement, wasn't yeah. it? That was incorporated. So, okay. So what happened here was Mr. Justice Sanfi described it as the battle of the forms. Basically, each time the the, the companies had written to each other in setting up this contract, they had incorporated, tried to incorporate their own con- their own terms. And what he effectively said was that once it came to sort of signing on the bottom line, the the, the communication of the acceptance, it was fairly clear that the Glanbia terms of purchase, the purchase terms had been incorporated. But even if the defendant's terms had been incorporated, he didn't accept that the GAFTA contract would have been incorporated into their terms. So one way or another, Ireland was the appropriate forum and the, the courts of Ireland can hear this particular okay. case. He didn't say anything about who brought the horse to France? <laughs> he did not mention the Kerry Girl issue, no. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very lame gag, but anyway, I had to throw it in. Finally, to an extra, extradition warrant case uh, that made it all the way to the Supreme Court and which concerned a Lithuanian national who was trying to resist moves by Lithuania to have him returned home so that he could serve a custodial sentence. This is the case of the Minister for Justice versus Carries, I think. is how Carries, you might, I think. Carries, yeah, yeah. Carries, okay. Uh, and Ms. Justice Baker issued judgment on behalf of the Supreme Court. Uh, Curiously, in this case, Mark, the defence team used a very technical ground yeah. uh, in order to try and stop the process yeah. of, of extradition. So basically, any extradition within the European Union uses what they call the European Arrest Warrant, which is a fairly sort of speedy way of, of getting somebody returned to another EU member state. And by and large, these cases are tick, tick box exercises. Um, you know, once the court is satisfied of certain things, they ought to extradite the person back to the um, to, to, to the country where the offence is alleged to have taken place, or in this case, where the offence has taken place and sentencing has been imposed. What happened here was that the um, the defendant had been convicted of drug trafficking, theft and criminal damage. He'd been sentenced to three years and seven months, but he left Lithuania and come to Ireland um, in the meantime. So since I think 2014 that the case took place, the the defen- the, um, the, the defense that they raised here was that that the def- that the accused or the offender in this case had um, developed a family life within Ireland. He had a child um, I- in Ireland, and that, he, that and so he said that what he would like to have been able to avail of was um, a European legislation which says that you can serve a custodial sentence in your own country. 
effectively. Now, Ireland hadn't actually transposed this European so legislation. So he was trying to say Ireland was his own country now? He was trying to say that, he oh, was li- okay. that Ireland was his country and that therefore he ought to be able to apply to serve his sentence in Ireland. And the problem here was that Ireland had not uh, transposed the relevant European legislation that allows for this reciprocal uh, re- recognition of sentences. He didn't get very far with Judge Baker. He didn't get very far. Well, he lost yeah, in the, the High Court, court yes, and then course. it was peeled up to the Supreme Court. And the, the, the Supreme Court essentially said, no, you're right under this European legislation is not to serve a sentence, it's simply to make the application. Now, they were very critical of the state in not having transposed this legislation, which dates back a number of years, but they said it didn't avail the accused or the offender in this particular case. Ultimately, it'll have to be up to Lithuania where the conviction was recorded. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Mark. Three great cases. Uh, And we're going to be back shortly with Ted Harding. At Practice Evolve, we ensure law firms have a clear pathway to the cloud while encouraging connectivity to improve overall productivity. Our focus on user competency also means law firms can discover new, innovative ways of working. We call it software with a service. Discover more today at www.practiceevolve.com. Silence in the fifth court. Well, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the studio Ted Harding, Senior Counsel. Uh, And Ted, of course, a lot of our colleagues will know, was a former editor of the Sunday Business Post. So a bit of crossover from journalism to law. Where where have I ever heard of that before, Ted? Uh, You're very welcome to the show. Many thanks for having me on, Peter. It's a great pleasure to follow the footsteps of my grandmaster, Justice Hogan. Yes, wow. Hasn't he been a sensation? He has. A true friend of the show. And we hope, we hope we can persuade him to come back. By popular demand, we want him back. So hopefully that will happen. So, Ted, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, your background first. You, you've been a barrister since nineteen since two thousand and four. Is that correct? I was called in Trinity nineteen ninety nine, and I commenced practice in Michaelmas uh, of two thousand and four. Um, in terms of background at school, I was always interested in history current affairs, politics, economics and the like. And uh, I was involved in debating and dramatic. So it's, you can see where this is going. Okay. Um, I was always interested in, in being a lawyer. And circumstances at the time in the mid-1980s meant that, uh, you know, if you didn't have a lot of connections in the legal world, uh, the priority okay, was getting so a job. a practical approach. Very sensible. Yes. Very sensible. Let's, let's go back then. So you went to Trinity College, I believe. Yes. And what did you study in Trinity? I studied politics and economics, and um, I was fortunate when I graduated uh, to get a job as a financial journalist with uh, a company called Lafferty Publications. Okay. And uh, In London? I'm sorry? In London? No, here. Uh, Very interestingly, uh, Michael Lafferty, who is um, the founder of the business, uh, was, uh, he is an Irish man from Roscommon, and uh, he was uh, the banking correspondent of the Financial Times. Uh, a very entrepreneurial man, so he set up his own specialist financial services consulting, conferencing and publications business. And uh, courtesy of the IDA in the late 1980s, he was able to set up an operation here. And uh, he really is to be credited with giving a large number of young journalists their start in media. And um, for instance, my colleague, former colleague at the Business Post, Kathleen Barrington, was among yes. those who, uh, who wrote um, for Michael, both in London and here in Dublin. And then after a short period of time, you joined the Business Post. Now, can you tell our listeners, and we are going to talk about law, guys, we're going to talk about law, but can you tell our listeners how radical was the Business Post back in the early days when well, it was set up in 1989? It was, and um, it, it was very interesting from a number of perspectives. First of all, it was a journalist newspaper. It was founded by journalists. The original team was led by editor Damien Kybird, Frank Fitzgibbon, James Morrissey and Aileen O'Toole. And I suppose it was a creature of its time because um, they decided that um, business journalism really wasn't being done as thoroughly or as penetratively as you like. And at the time, if you cast your mind back, in the early 1990s, that was really the period in which the veil was cast pulled back in Irish society. First of all, we had the business political scandals, then the tribunals, and then the clerical abuse um, scandal and scandals. And the Business Post was really to the fore in writing um, leading edge articles at the time. I mean, if real news can be defined as something that someone somewhere does not want you to know about, that's what the Business Post was in the business of writing. Yes. And inevitably, that brought you into conflict with very powerful, 
very well-resourced institutions, corporates and individuals. And over time, um, you know, the Business Post became involved in some very high-profile uh, litigation. I mean, if you cast your mind back, some of the most outstanding journalists of their generation and, and people who are still in journalism worked for or began at the, at the Post at that time. Yes. Um, James Morrissey did um, some very, very good investigative work. Um, contemporaries of mine included Kathleen Barrington, Matt Cooper, Brian Carey, um, Susan O'Keefe predated me, but she began her work on the, the meat industry at the Post. And of course, uh, it, it should never be forgotten that the late Veronica Geeran Yes. Or began her journalistic career Post. Yes, at the absolutely. Post. And of course, your founding editor, Damien Kyber. Kyber. You've got to give a mention to him. Well, no, we already have. And uh, I mean, he deserves great credit for setting the tone and taking, you know, great risks at the time. Um, I should uh, say, and also the odd radical editorial as well. I remember well, post Good Friday yes. Agreement. What happened there, Ted? Uh, well, well, look, let's the be clear. The continuity business post wasn't well, that the, no, the phrase afterwards. The, the business afterwards? post had a very clear um, position on the national question. The colour of the masthead wasn't green by accident, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, I, I maintain that. Um, I have certain views about you know the way things are conducted on this island. They're pretty much consistent with Damien's view at the time, I, I would have hoped. And, you know, in the fullness of time, if you look at the way in which things have evolved, the peace process and such like, the bringing into mainstream politics um, parties and individuals that were on the periphery, to put it mildly, um, you know, matters have evolved. And I think the direction of travel of the Business Post in its early years has been absolutely vindicated. OK, no, and absolutely. And continues. Absolutely. And, and but can I say as well, yes, just sure. in terms of the, of, the, of the law, I mean, the law was never far from um, the picture. And it should be said and acknowledged that the Business Post, particularly in its early years and later, had the benefit of some excellent legal advisors. And I mean, any lawyer will be able to tell you why you shouldn't publish an article or a news story. A really good pre-publication lawyer will tell you how to publish it. Yes. And the Post had excellent advisors. For instance, I think of um, now senior counsel uh, Seamus O'Toole. Yes, himself, of course. Previously yes. a very distinguished journalist with newspapers such as the United Irishman. Um, Seamus was excellent. He did a lot of the pre-publication work. Um, yeah, in the 90s. Barrister, yes. And also uh, another uh, person who, a uh, solicitor who would need, would need no uh, introduction to listeners of this podcast, Michael Farrell. Yeah, of course. Uh, of Michael E. Hanahoe, uh, whose, you know, activism in the North is the stuff of legend, who mm. was heavily involved with uh, FLAC. I'm just hearing a couple of guests for our show, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Going yeah. forward. Oh, Thank you, Ted. Yeah. You know, you'll have this to get is, a, finder's fee for us, a finder's mm. fee. So, um, you know, and, 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 and can I just, can I just yes. say, and it's very important, and we will move into law. And in the, in the midst of all this, working in this really fascinating and exciting environment, you managed to qualify as a barrister, so that's pretty impressive. But you did become the first person post um, Damien Kybert to be the editor of the paper. Like that was a great achievement. Uh, well, yes. I mean, the circumstances were such after I, I was called to the bar. I mean, I intended to go practice, but things changed at the paper. And essentially from the middle of 2000 until the, the uh, late 2004, most of that time, I was either acting editor or editor of the paper. And uh, it, it was a pretty convulsive time. Um, but, you know, we still you know, continued with the, the ethos of the paper. Um, it did uh, leading edge work at the time. I mean, for instance, if I can just instance three cases. Yes. I think anybody who is familiar with, with Irish uh, defamation law and, and the like um, can't but be struck by the number of times the Business Post crops up. Uh, and the first major case was involving uh, the Beef Tribunal, where in 1992, the High Court um, upheld the right of the tribunal uh, to make an order obliging Damien Kybert and uh, reporter Brian Carey to appear before it and tell the tribunal the source or sources of information on which they had published um, two articles and identify the person or persons from whom the information had been obtained. Now, this is about as fundamental an intrusion upon the work of a newspaper as it's possible to conceive of. Um, the journalists, needless to say, uh, did not divulge their sources and no charges were brought against them. Um, in 2003, businessman Dennis O'Brien obtained an injunction against uh, in the High Court. Against and you were the, the editor's chair now at I this was point, at this yes. Stage. And the order prevented the Post from publishing a story about the Revenue Commissioner's investigation into his tax affairs arising from the sale of his stake in telecoms company ESET Telecom. 
And that a form of super injunction um, was granted. Uh, the order also prevented the Post and any other media outlets uh, from report- reporting the fact that the injunction had actually been granted and that barred re- the, the reporting of the related uh, court proceedings. Um, the Supreme Court ultimately upheld our challenge to the reporting bar. And you'd be familiar with the 2009 Defamation Act, which effectively abolished the granting yes. of super injunctions. So, so in reality, you're getting as much courtroom action as a journalist, as you subsequently got. Uh, Not as intentionally, a, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, certainly, yes. Yeah, no, it, 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 is, it was, but like, isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's what journalism is about, cutting edge, push it to the edge all the time and see, publish and be damned, basically. You know, obviously you must be, you know, cautious in terms of what you put out and you can't break the law, but uh, it is very important to get the story out and Ted, I could see you're fearless in doing that. Okay, so you came down to the law library uh, and, and you know, you had to devil with somebody? I did. Um, I mean, the backstory of that is in 2002, there was a change of ownership of the newspaper. Thomas Crosby Holdings acquired the paper. I was involved in a rival bid, um, which was unsuccessful. I mean, it's a matter of public record. The acquisition was not a success for the newspaper. Um, I left in, in 2004, in late 2004, Subsequently, unfortunately, the newspaper entered examinership a few years later. It was purchased out of examinership and then repurchased and continues, obviously, And it's still today. alive today. Absolutely. And, and a wonderful publication. Very much so. And, and, and good and, and one that we were associated with at one stage, mm-hmm. Mark. We must acknowledge yes. that. Uh, uh, in old, terms old of... Old friends, old friends. Absolutely. Okay, in terms so of devilling, the bar. devilling um, I was very fortunate that I was able to devil with two, two excellent lawyers uh, who are friends. They're still friends when last I checked. The first was uh, Conleth Bradley. Um, who uh, at the time was a leading junior counsel practicing in the area of judicial review, administrative law and planning. During the Devlin year, Conleth uh, became a senior counsel. And uh, Peter Ward, um, then BL, oh, good. Was, okay. was good enough wow. to, uh, to act as my master. Peter was a leading practitioner in the area of employment law and labor law at the time. Subsequently, he became a senior, no more than Conleth, and they both have gone on to st- have storied careers, as they say. No, well, two wonderful people to devil with. Mark, do you want to come in there for a second? Well, I suppose what, what interests me is, you know, obviously you were very involved in defamation in journalistic, in your journalistic days. But um, the area of privacy law has really grown since then. Was that something that you were that you were concerned much with in your journalistic days or has that really just exploded since? It really um, has only um, developed since um, I left print journalism. And, you know, though, again, there's a certain type of litigation pursued by a certain type of person hmm. that if defamation isn't working, well, then perhaps I might claim that my privacy is being invaded. Sure. And you can draw your own conclusions. Absolutely. But, but, it, but it, wasn't, it wasn't keeping you awake at night the way Not that it, it would it, be it now if you were an issue working on, no. in the area. And frankly, the, to- the sort of journalism we were doing, I, I don't think you could say it wasn't, if, if you look at the UK and if you look at the phone hacking, scandal. Yeah. If you look at the highly intrusive hmm. journalism, which probed into the very private personal dealings of hmm. people, that wasn't the business post stock and trade. Yeah. So it really wasn't on the, on the horizon at all for sure. us. Okay, well, you had uh, obviously a lot of high-profile investigations, as you said. There were, you know, the era, especially the 1990s, was the era of sort of investigation and institutions of the state being looked at much more closely, uh, and that was very important. Okay, so you, you got in. Let's go back to your legal career for, for a little while, Ted. So you, you devil with two of the greats, in fairness. You had a great start, and you didn't necessarily go into defamation media-related law at that stage. You're, you're a business hack at heart, I think, aren't you? And it's sort of well, commercial business was driving you in that direction? It was, but I mean, look, let's, I mean, given the fact that I had been the editor of a newspaper, I, I was a financial journalist. I mean, I'd like to think I knew something about markets. And in terms of selling points, um, you know, where did I have something that I could offer that perhaps others didn't? And so it was natural that I gravitated towards business and commercial um, practice. The other issue was, in practical terms, I had been the editor of a newspaper. I didn't really relish the prospect of acting against either people that were contemporaries of mine or that I knew, um, in other words, doing plaintiff work at that time. Now, I did a lot of pre-publication work and advisory work and and eventually a media law practice developed. But I just wasn't comfortable with having my name on writs being issued against people that 
some of them were my friends. Some of them were contemporaries. Now, why was that? that? I don't understand that, actually. Didn't didn't like us. It. it didn't. You know, I think but it's somebody not about else. The gig, else you know, cab rank rule. We go out, we represent there whoever. Is, we need yes. representation. I'm going to do it. I'm there, there for you, man. There is, but I mean, they, look, there there is a line um, where you know ethically and also if you if personally, if you know the individual or individuals involved, you're, you're reluctant um, to get involved in that. And, yeah, well, um, of course, it's yes. personal relationships. I it understand was. that, of course. So, yes. I mean, that, that's and, and that was in the main. So, but I really planes focused, of work generally, you weren't interested. In, uh, that my, I did. I did very little of it, and, and that that's obviously as time passed, I, I, I did, have been involved in more of it. But in the early years, I, I, it's not something that I sought out. I mean, I was very fortunate in the early years that I either worked with or alongside um, some exceptional um, senior counsel, for instance, in the administrative law area, James O'Reilly, um, Anthony Collins, um, for instance, who's subsequently become an advocate general of the, the European Court of Justice, um, in the commercial and business area, the likes of Martin Hayden and, uh, and Michael Howard, who uh, good hurling fans, um, they certainly, in strictly legal terms, acquainted me with the finer Claire arts. and Kilkenny, I Absolutely, think, Absolutely, yes. yeah, the, the finer points of ground hurling <laughs> um, in terms of, of business and uh, personal, uh, uh, sorry, uh, professional negligence um, litigation. And also uh, in terms of the media and defamation work, uh, the now Mr. Justice Paul Burns of the High Court Turlock O'Donnell, Hugh Mohan, and also uh, in more general practice, the okay. likes of Shane Murphy. Yeah, so look, you've had a, you've had a wonderful experience and, uh, and obviously all sides, both sides need to be represented, Ted, and if you're representing one side more than the other, mm. of course, that's perfectly fine. Um, one thing I associated you with, and I, I followed you in the papers a little bit, was uh, the very high profile investigations, the criminal investigations that took place after the collapse of the Anglo-Irish Bank. Now, I know you can't talk specifically about any case you were involved with, but you did act, you can tell us who you acted for, mm. And you did act for some of the high-profile management personalities associated with the bank who got into bother. Can you just give us yes, generally I mean, an outline the, of that? The background really to this was um, I came into those cases because uh, of the regulatory and uh, company law um, and, and enforcement um, aspects uh, where I practised. I mean, uh, credit where it's due, um, the likes of Bill Houlihan, the solicitor, uh, briefed me. It was a bankruptcy specialist and insolvency specialist briefed me early and uh, also I uh, got a lot of support from uh, Michael E. Hanahoe and Tony Hanahoe and in the fullness of time I was briefed by Hanahoe's and specifically Carthage Conlon um, solicitor when he was there uh, in the Anglo related cases and uh, I was very fortunate to work with um, Patrick Gageby in three of the Anglo cases um, we acted for uh, William McAteer um, yes. in, who was the former finance director of Anglo-Irish Bank in, in two cases. We acted for Aoife Maguire, uh, who was um, formerly an assistant manager in, in Anglo-Irish Bank in respect of another. And in uh, the final case, I, I appeared with uh, Michael O'Higgins, senior counsel, another former journalist. Okay, um, yeah, For absolutely. Dennis Casey, the, um, the former uh, group chief executive of Irish Life and Permanent. Now, they were big trials. They went on for a long time and, and very, very high profile. And I'm sure very challenging acting and representing people who were under an awful lot of pressure. I mean, there was a societal view. Uh, we, we previously did a, an interview on this uh, this show with uh, a well-known criminal defence lawyer who talked about, you know, media representation and being aware of that in relation to your clients. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of intense scrutiny on these individuals. Was that something you were aware of when you were representing Oh, entirely. Them? I mean, I, but it, it was interesting I mean, the, the I was briefed initially in in the autumn of 2012. Um, the first of those those cases, the the Section 60 case involving the Maple Ten and the and the Quins, the lending by Anglo to them, began in 2014, and there was a long run into it. And at that stage, really, a lot of the heat had gone out of um, the public view of Anglo, the banks generally. I remember uh, the opening of the the Section sixty case. I mean, there was there were there was an, an additional courtroom set aside for the overspill from the public gallery. Um, it was barely filled. The largest crowd that attended the, the court, really from memory, was when Sean Quinn Senior appeared, and busloads of supporters arrived down from the border. Uh, the border country um, to support. I think. I think the whole nation was interested as well, though. I think. It, I think <laughs> it certainly was. And I mean, I, I think in hindsight, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, if you look at the case of um, the late Sean Fitzpatrick, the the former yes. chairman and chief executive of Anglo Irish Bank. I mean, if you were offered odds 
in 2009, 2010, that Sean Fitzpatrick will be acquitted Quitted. by a Dublin jury. And he was the only one that was acquitted. Um, Am he, I right on that? Uh, well, yeah, correct. Well, the others, uh, for instance, um, so were successful on appeal. Yes. Um, yes, the, sorry, at first two, instance, yes. of course. Yes. yes. And uh, obviously, um, Sean Fitzpatrick's, um, one of, of the cases collapsed uh, in respect of him, uh, and he was acquitted in the Section 60 um, case. But, you know, and in that one as well, the, the, the actions of the regulator really became uh, front and centre. And um, our client, uh, Mr. McAteer, and uh, Patrick Whelan, I mean, received community service sentences. Yes. And the presiding judge in sentencing, um, Judge Martin Nolan, um, said that, you know, that these men have been led into error by the regulator. Yeah, can I, can I just ask, when it comes to these kind of high-profile, white-collar criminal trials, I mean, they're, they're very resource-heavy, aren't they? I mean, you know, I mean, is, is the state properly equipped to bring those sort of cases? Because you only really hear about the, these sort of large ones, but there must be, there must be small-scale, should we say, business offences happening all the time, which, which, which never really m m see the light of day. I mean, is, is, is Ireland properly equipped to deal with well, these things? I, I think in, in fairness to the DPP and to the Gardaí, I mean, they got through a, a phenomenal amount of work particularly in the last trial, the 7.2 billion um, fraud trial, mm. um, where we acted for Mr. Casey. And, you know, you had documents running into the millions. You had 800,000 individual uh, exhibits and such like. All printed um, out numerous times uh, for the various different exactly. parties. Exactly. On disclosure, as you know, in a criminal case, sure. everything has to be made available and all, we had to go through all of this. And in terms of the technology, um, you know, there were great efforts made to make documents available on screen, not only for the witnesses, for counsel and for the jury. And I think from a background where we didn't have a history mm. of major fraud trials as they have in the neighboring jurisdiction, you know, it was quite an achievement yeah. um, for, you know, the state to put on and carry through fairly. Mm. Um, prosecutions of that level of complexity. And I think it also, I mean, regardless of the outcome, I mean, this idea that, oh, a jury of lay people can't understand the issues and such like, um, I think that you, was... You think the juries, that the, the, a, a, a jury can fairly hear cases of that complexity? Well, my, my experience, certainly um, from, you know, our experience over mm. protracted periods, I mean, the, the 7.2 billion a uh, fraud trial as a matter of record I mean, that lasted almost 90 days. Right. And, um, you know, uh, you had a very attentive jury. Right. Okay, can we go back to just media stuff again, um, Ted? You know, look, looking at, at where we stand, I mean, I know you act in, in defamation cases and you've been in some high-profile defamation cases. Uh, just reading reading a, a book, actually a review in the paper there recently by Jeffrey Robertson, well-known QC in the UK, and he was talking about how freedom of expression doesn't exist in the UK. That's kind of the premise of his book that basically now you have, and he was talking about all Russian oligarchs who come in and immediately put these kind of lawsuits and stop publication, mm. etc. Um, but we, we are in a situation where it is very difficult sometimes to tell the story. Do you feel the way the Defamation Act operates that it is more of a shield or is it more offering the opportunity to give freedom of expression? Well, one of the, the black ironies of um, this country is that we have in the Constitution a specified yes, right, a freedom of expression. Right, yes. But on the other side, of it, we have had since the foundation of the state one of the most repressive and restrictive media law regimes anywhere in the Western world. It should be said we do also have the right to our good name protection in the Constitution. Well, we so do. They, we they do. have to be balanced. Oh, they do, yes. But, but also the sharp edge of it is um, the stories that have not been published and could not be published um, for reasons of oppression and fear and catastrophic financial consequences. I mean, it's an extreme example, I know. But I mean, look at the story that's been dominating the news for the last number of weeks. Um, Blackrock College, the Spiritons. Yes. Now, is that evidence of a culture, a society that was open, transparent, where people in positions of power and trust were open to scrutiny 
but I mean, the, the, the clerical sex abuse has been part of the media narrative since the early 1990s. So, I mean, it does, it, it, you know, it's not as if um, it, it wasn't possible to make those allegations. It seems to be particular schools have had that kind of culture it of, is, but, but, whether but you I, call it a murder or whatever you... But what I'm talking about is more in more general terms. It was a very closed society. It was a society in which clear wrongdoing hmm. was not exposed. Yes. And I'm not talking hmm. about just but the clerical abuse. it's not a more cultural here. thing, really. I mean, at the end of the day, the story was broken by the national media, or RTE, if you know what I mean. Ultimately, now only now, not in the 80s or the 90s or the, the 70s, when, when a lot of these acts were being perpetrated. Exactly. And, and but, also, but that was more a cultural, that was a cultural thing, rather rather than just kind of defamation laws or kind well, of the laws I, of the I land. wouldn't entirely agree with that because the difficulty in actually publishing, I mean, the, the stories are legion of journalists and editors with notebooks filled with notes um, in, in respect of sensational stories. And look, for instance, go back to Susan O'Keefe that I referred to yes. a few minutes ago. The Beef Tribunal, exactly. famously. The only person prosecuted for it, yes. Exactly. But also, um, where did she have to go to ventilate the issues? ITN, wasn't it? Uh, UTV, was World, UTV. World in Action. World in Action, yes. Mm. Not yeah, yeah. here. Mm. Why? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, people were frightened. Of course, I'm, uh, I'm with you completely. I mean, I think, I think we need, we need laws because that allow instance, the story I mean, to come uh, out. Undoubtedly, at the time, with the, the Business Post, because of its size and resourcing, the stakes were massive. But was it, there, could, it could have put the newspaper out of business in circumstances where, in the fullness of time, it was shown that there were real issues of public interest to be addressed and examined. But does, does that explain, for example, the, the, the failure to um, expose some of the issues concerning Charles Hawhey? I mean, it, it often appeared it was almost more of a sort of culture of politeness rather than a culture of fear of, um, uh, of, fear of defamation. I mean, the information was known and simply wasn't pursued. Uh, well, I wouldn't agree with you that information was known. Um, what was provable, what was established. I mean, I, I watched Sean O'Rourke's uh, Two Tribes um, series um, on RTE over the Christmas break, and uh, I think it was Peter Prendergast, yes. uh, one of the interviewees, said that, oh, sure, we knew how he was, uh, was in serious uh, debt. And how did you know? Because bankers told us. Really? I mean, you can imagine the difficulty in terms of getting one of those bankers, any of those bankers, to go on the record and substantiate what they were saying to the main opposition party at the time. So, so what do we do now, Ted? This is the point. What do we do now? I mean, you know, as somebody who practices in law and who's very familiar with the Defamation Act and who is, gets up in court and has to represent clients on either side of the fence uh, in relation to that, but also, you know, in your, in your memory box, you can remember being an editor and you can, be a remember, um, you can remember trying to get the story out and being fearful and lawyers telling you, no, Ted, hold back now, pull back a little bit there in relation to that. So what is the solution? How do we give effect to the constitutional right to freedom of expression, or as Mark says, the right to one's good name? Well, I think, I mean, there has been a lot of commentary um, coming out of the States in particular about slap actions. Yes. I mean, these are sort of effectively intimidatory um, proceedings or threats of proceedings. Uh, look, the three of us know of a culture where, you know, the letter, the issuing of the writ to stay the hand of the journalist and the newspaper, that has been a common practice in this country for decades. And it is, it is a real challenge where you have a litigant against you who is extremely well resourced and who can drag out the process and impose potentially huge costs upon a potential publisher. Yes, and I mean, I suppose that has happened and, and, and we probably know of cases like that. Um, so, yeah, look, it's an imperfect system. Anyway, this has been an absolutely fascinating, fascinating insight um, Ted, into giving your background as a, as a newspaper editor and your very extensive and successful practice as a barrister. Now, we're going to finish with a couple of questions. Uh, Mark, do you want to ask him about our traditional questions? Our traditional about books, final questions. Movies, indeed, yes, uh, even pieces of music. You, you refer to, to, you, to Justice Hogan there. He's a, he's a music fan, as indeed you know. Indeed, he is. Have you a work of art or a, a um, piece I, of literature some you'd books, like to recommend? I'm, I'm aware of some of the, the recommendations that have been given in the past, so I've gone for a, a few other pottery, ones. even if you oh, like no, to. No, you know. no, no. I've gone for anybody who's interested in the nexus between um, money, uh, power, and law. Oh, geez, um, we're all interested. First of all, um, Servants of the Damned. 
giant law firms and the corruption of justice by David Enrich. Not that we're suggesting that all giant law firms are evil or anything like that. Absolutely not. not. All of them. Second one, um, Doing Justice by uh, Preet Bharara, who is oh. the famous former U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. Okay. Um, in pop culture terms, his prosecutions gave rise to the Billions television series. Okay. But more to the point, he is the man who, on principle, um, got in Donald Trump's way and was sacked. And his book is very well worth reading. Um, a couple of other ones. He now actually has his own podcast. Um, stay tuned with uh, with Pete, with Preet rather. Um, a couple of other ones, rather his own man. You mentioned um, Jeffrey Robertson yes. um, in court with tyrants, tarts and troublemakers. Yes. Um, also, Memoirs of a Radical Lawyer uh, by Michael Mansfield, yes. now KC, yeah. who Absolutely. will always in this country be remembered for his uh, excellent work in respect of Birmingham Bloody Six. Sunday and also the, um, the Birmingham Six. There's another book, it's, it's quite an old book at this stage, but it really is worth reading for anybody who is interested in media law. And that's uh, No Ordinary Man, um, A Life of George Carman. Yes. And that was yeah. written by his son, Dominic Carman. Now, it's an extraordinary, unsparing biography of a brilliant but deeply flawed man. A man um, who was half Irish, I believe. His mother was from Waterford, am I correct? Indeed, I think, yes, there is an Irish background, yes. Um, in terms of documentaries, um, the recently premiered Madoff, The Monster of, Mo of Wall Street. haven't watched it. Are you recommending Netflix, this, Netflix, absolutely, yes. Oh, very good, okay. Another one is Scandal, uh, Bringing Down Wirecard. That's the digital payment business. Um, Germany's biggest ever accounting scandal, well worth watching. And finally, a personal favourite, the second report of the Moriarty Tribunal of Inquiry. <laughs> Always worth dipping into. <laughs> a bodice ripping yarn, I think, isn't it? Absolutely. Isn't that brilliant? It's Mark, fantastic. have you got enough room in your page I, I, now I, I, to put I, on I, all those I, I, recommendations? I'll try, I'll try and get, get your, by the end of the year. You have to exactly. get your ruler and, your, and draw mm. a few more mm. lines onto the end of the page. That is absolutely brilliant, Ted. Ted, can I thank you? Ted Harding, Senior Counsel, former editor of the Sunday Business Post. Thank you so much for coming in and being a guest on The Fifth Court. Pleasure. At Practice Evolve, we ensure law firms have a clear pathway to the cloud while encouraging connectivity to improve overall productivity. Our focus on user competency also means law firms can discover new, innovative ways of working. We call it software with a service. Discover more today at www.practiceevolve.com. The Fifth Court will adjourn until next week. So that's all from this edition of The Fifth Court. We hope you have enjoyed it. Can we say a huge thank you to our guest, Senior Counsel Ted Harding, for coming in and giving us a fascinating interview and telling us about the transition from being a national newspaper editor to a barrister practising in the law library. I found that really interesting. Uh, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our producer, Cunnell O'Moroyne, for his wonderful work and to the Dublin South Podcast Studios and Mr Lee Brennan in particular for recording this show show and doing such a wonderful job. If you have any comments or any legal stories you'd like to raise with us, please contact us on our website or on LinkedIn. Uh, and Mark, our parting message, oh, I was going to say our parting message always is share, but we have another parting message. We do indeed. Sponsor, we Mark. need to thank our all. sponsor, Practices Evolved Software, which combines document management and accounting software and offers law firms a what they call a holistic practice management solution built with lawyers in mind. Wow. And they, we want to thank them very much for their support yeah, of this no, podcast. And, and genuinely, it's, it's, it's very important in order to, to bring this to you. Uh, that we have the, the support mm -hmm. of a sponsor. So we're very grateful for that. And it's also that. fair to say, Peter, your voice has held up very well, well considering you, the, what, you, what, what you've had to suffer <laughs> thought, over thought, the uh, Christmas period. I thought I was period. going to be ringing in sick, but uh, we, we managed to get through. The show well, must you know, go on. Hey, you know, leaning on your shoulder, Mark, I'll, I'll always make it through. Uh, so for me anyway, Peter Leonard. Uh, and myself, Mark Tottenham. Until the next time, see you soon in the Fifth Court. Mm -hmm.